Now with our lesson for this morning, Eric Brandt. Good morning. Good morning. This morning when I uh, emerged from my room and uh, greeted my father this morning, he said, that's quite a loud shirt you are wearing this morning. <laughs> And I said, yes it is, it most certainly is. And you wouldn't think one would wear a bright orange shirt when preaching from the book of Job. But I thought, hmm, yes, a loud shirt. And that's the kind of shirt that we need when we preach the gospel according to Job. Huh? What, is, what do you mean the gospel according to Job? Well, Job represents the human condition. And Job expresses the human experience under God's sovereignty. We also know the end of the story. We know the answer to the suffering of man that was provided for us in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So I, we know that there is hope. We know that the end of the story is good. But to get to that end of the story, the human condition is such that we go through a lot of pain, a lot of trial. The book of Job is such that we get to see the human condition in a way that poets, philosophers, writers of many kinds cannot begin to plumb the depths of human experience. Job represents one of those great pieces of literature that helps go deep within the experience of all. We meet Job in chapter 4 in the pit of despair. When I say the pit of despair, some of you might think of the movie The Princess Bride, where Wesley, the hero of the story, is captured by evil men and he is thrown into the pit of despair. And he is taken away from Buttercup, the woman that he loved. And he is brought into a place of torture, a place of depths of human uh, pain. We meet Job in that condition in chapter three, where he rues the day that he was born. He wished that that day could be turned to darkness. He wished that the day when the morning stars came out on that day, that they would cease to be. May that night be barren, that no shout of joy be heard on it. Why did I, I not perish at birth and die before I came from the womb? Had I not been born on that day, I would be asleep and at rest. I would be with kings and counselors of the earth who built themselves palaces that are now lying in ruins with rulers that had gold. Why was I not hidden in the ground like a stillborn child? There are a few chapters in scripture that reach the depth of despair that chapter 3 of Job represents. Now someone who is in that kind of pain needs some good friends. Does he not? Do they not? We have to give Job's friends credit for what they did when they came to him. At first they came to Job and they spent seven days of silence simply being with Job simply 
silently uh, being for being with him and being before him. But after they heard Job's complaints, they each had to speak. They each had to give their advice to him. And they were well-meaning. And the words that they gave to Job were a mixture of good advice and bad advice. They each came to Job with what they thought was wise counsel, but it was not precisely what he needed. After that time where they sat in silence with him for seven, seven days, various of his friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, they came before him with a variety of pieces of advice to him. Essentially, they were communicating messages such as, Job, you are suffering because you have sinned. Job, if you would just simply admit your sin, you would cease from suffering. Because surely does not God lift up the righteous and bring down those who are not righteous? Job, your sin may deserve even more suffering than you're experiencing. Job, God is using this suffering to mold and shape your character. Well, whereas there may be a grain of truth in this, sometimes this advice can be ill-timed. Sometimes this advice, instead of salve on hurting wounds, instead they can be like vinegar to the eyes. They can be painful words in times of difficulty and not words of comfort. The, Job's pain was such that he was confused. Job came to his friends and he says, what you say makes no sense because I understand God's sovereignty and had I indeed, if I indeed had sin on my hands, I would confess it to the Almighty. If indeed I was unrighteous, the Lord would indeed judge me. But we know from the beginning of this book that Job was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. So to simply explain his suffering as being because of his sin was an incomplete picture of, the, of what was happening. Job, at various times, describes his experience. After Eliphaz the Temanite gave his advice to you, after Eliphaz the Temanite said, If I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him, for he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. However good that advice might have said, Job replied, he said, If only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, I would surely, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. No wonder my words have been impetuous. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks in their poison. God's terrors are marshaled against me. Does a wild donkey bray when it has grass or an ox bellow when it has fodder? Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant what I hope for. That God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have this consolation. 
my joy in unrelenting pain that I had not denied the words of the Holy One. The truth of the matter is, Job's suffering could not be explained by the simple answers of sin or unrighteousness or failure to call upon the Lord because he had done all of these things. What strength do I have, said Job, that I should still hope? What prospects that I should be patient? Do I have the strength of stone? Is my flesh bronze? Do I have any power to help myself now that success has been driven from me? The human condition is one that we are here for just but a short period of time. And sometimes those days are spent in trouble and difficulty and pain. And we don't understand why God does not just simply redeem us or why he doesn't just simply allow us to be set free from our troubled condition. The question of evil, the question of pain, the question of suffering, these have perplexed the deepest of poets, the wisest of philosophers, the most eloquent of artists. It is, it is the, the topic that has perplexed preachers of, of all kinds. Who can understand the mind of God? Who can understand the situation that we are in? Yesterday, I allowed the, uh, I was privileged to have the words of Louis Armstrong uh, filling the, the walls of the Olney Church building where he's, I, where his recording of nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. <laughs> yes, my Lord. Sometimes we're almost to the ground. Yes, my Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. And I think that's true. It's great to have friends who will be with us in times of trouble. The truth of the matter is nobody knows the trouble we've seen. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus has entered into the depth of pain like he has. Jesus knew what it was like to be forsaken of his friends, his friends who had pledged to be with him, friends like Peter who says, though all come against you, I will never Though all forsake you, I will never forsake you. But sure enough, Peter denied Jesus three times. His disciples who had been with him, who had watched him perform miracles, who had been discipled by him, fell asleep when he was at his time of pain in the Garden of Gethsemane. What kind of friends were his disciples? Well, we might think, well, we would be better friends than they, though I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think we're stronger than Peter. I don't think we're stronger than the, the disciples of the Lord. I, I think we all need the grace of God to grow in steadfast love in a time of need. So we're on this journey. Job expresses pain. He's in the pit of despair. His friends give ill advice to him. And though some of what they said contained elements of truth, yet their advice did not fully grasp the situation. 
And yet, we do have a friend who sticks closer to, than a brother, a, a friend who sticks closer to the brother than a brother, and that is our Lord. We have someone who sticks closer to a brother, closer than a brother. When we don't know, when even we do not know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit prays on our behalf with groans that words cannot express. Even when we do not know how to respond, it says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Even when we are perplexed, we are told that we can call upon the Lord. We are explained, we are told in Paul's letter to the Romans, in Romans chapter 8, it says, The whole creation has been groaning, as in, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present moment. Not only that, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit. We can call on the name of the Lord, who will be there, who will be with us in our times of need. I'd like for us to look through Job for a while and to look at how these concepts that I have presented this morning, if you wish to open up your Bibles to Job, I'd like for us to hear some of this poetic language that can be found in this glorious book. There is some tremendous imagery that can bring us to a place of worship, that can bring us into a place of the glory of God, but it also teaches us about the human condition. It teaches us that only God only God completely understands this world in which we live. Open up, please, to Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12. After Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, after they give some advice, to Job that is ill-advised. Listen to how Job responds to them. Doubtless, you are the people and wisdom will die with you. Surely you are the most wise people on earth. But I have a mind as well as you. I am not inferior to you, who does not know all of these things? I have become a laughing stock to my friends. Though I call upon God and he answered, a mere laughing stock, though righteous and blameless. Men at ease have contempt for misfortune as the fate of those whose feet are slipping. The tents of marauders are undisturbed, and those who provoke God are secure. Those who carry their God in their hands. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature, and the breath of all mankind. Does not the ear test words as the tongue tastes food? 
Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. What he tears down cannot be rebuilt. The man he imprisons cannot be released. If he holds back the waters, there is drought. If he lets them loose, they devastate the land. To him belong strength and victory, both deceived and deceiver are his. He leads counselors away stripped and makes fools of judges. He takes off the shackles put on by kings and ties a loincloth around their waist. He leads priests away stripped and over overthrows men long established. He silences the lips of trusted advisors and takes away the discernment of elders. He pours contempt on nobles and disarms the mighty. He reveals the deep things of darkness and brings deep shadows into the light. <clears throat> he makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and disperses them. He deprives the leaders of the earth of their reason he sends them wandering through a trackless waste. They grope in darkness with no light. He makes them stagger like drunkards. Chapter 13, my eyes have seen all of this. My ears have heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you, but I desire to speak to the Almighty, to argue my case before God. What Job needed was a mediator. He needed someone to argue his case before God. He saw God's sovereignty. He saw the condition of the world. He saw how nations rise up, how nations are torn down. He saw how rulers rise up, how rulers are brought down. He saw how human beings are born, how human beings die. How our lives are but a hand breadth. How the wicked seem to flourish and how the righteous seem to suffer. And in a world where there's, there's this kind of suffering and where the, the rules of right and wrong do not seem to work the way they should, we need someone to plead our case before God. We need somebody who will stick closer to us than a brother. We need someone to see us through. And this is where we have the good news. This is where we turn to the New Testament, to Romans 8, which I mentioned earlier. And we learn about that mediator. We learn about that friend who sticks closer to a brother. We learn, such as in verse 18, that as Paul writes in Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, where the creation that has been suffering, that has been groaning in the pains of childhood, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one 
who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. This, this is the good news. This is, this is why we have something to proclaim. This is why we have something that we can put our entire weight in. Because the answers that we have will stand firm in a time of trouble. The answers that have been given to us will stand up in the trials of life. <clears throat> Try to find any other answer that will stand up to the <coughs> depth of questions. It's had a bad day. <laughs> That's right. Try to find any other answer other than the gospel to these kinds of questions. Timothy Keller has made it his life work. Actually, God made it. God gave Timothy Keller his life's work, his calling, to go to a very secular place, New York City, when he arrived and, and started a congregation in downtown New York City. Only about, it was an estimate, about 3% of the population would attend church on any given Sunday. 3% of the population in downtown Manhattan. A very secular, very business-oriented, very um, hard-driving place. But as he explained the gospel in ways that that population could understand, in, in ways that made sense, where he applied what Scripture says about the human condition and applied it to the world, or applied it to the world of commerce, applied it, applied it to the suffering that we see in the world, and how it could stand up to any of the philosophical questions that could be thrown at it. People started coming because they said, yes, there are no easy answers, but there are answers. And, and these answers have, provided, have been provided in Scripture to greater depth than any other answer has been provided in the history of the world. Now, does that sound like a grand claim? Perhaps. But where else will you go to find answers to these deep questions? Whenever I hear, whenever I hear this term, life's persistent questions, uh, those of you who listen I mentioned a couple of weeks ago to Prairie Home Companion. There's a man in Prairie Home Companion, this show that's been on for many decades, of Guy Noir Private Eye, who is constantly looking for answers to life's persistent questions. Well, nobody will be able to answer life's persistent questions like Jesus. Nobody will be able to answer life's persistent questions like those inspired writers of scripture who wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God to write the books that we have preserved for us in our Bibles. And whether it be the book, the book of Job, whether it be Ecclesiastes, which we will be studying in a number of weeks, whether it be the Gospels, where we learn about Jesus, whether it be the letters of Paul, these provide light for our path to life's persistent questions, the kind of questions that Job raised, and that God knows that we are asking those questions, and he will respond to us. Shall we pray, please? Our Father, we must 
come before you. Often in silence. Because we often do not know how we ought to pray. We do not know how we ought to respond to you in light of the challenges of life. But we thank you that you understand our need and that you have provided a way for us to boldly come before you and to open up our hearts with all of these questions on our hearts. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer on behalf of those on our hearts who are suffering. We ask for your grace for those who have lost life and loved ones, and we ask for your, your grace and mercy on Haiti. We ask for your grace and mercy on those in each of our hearts who are suffering from illness or bereavement or of any of a number of, of pain and grief and suffering and loss. Hear our prayer, hear our cry, and open our hearts up to your spirit who works in our hearts and who prays on our behalf and is the mediator on our behalf before you. Hear our prayer, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God stick closer to us than a brother. Whatever your needs might be, we can bring them to him. He will hear us. We do have brothers and sisters who will, who will uphold us in a time of need. We are told to encourage one another daily, to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Whatever your need might be, please make it known as we stand and sing. Sweetly born and we 